The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability explicit or implied shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Churchill said, those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. Kevin Hallinan believes that certainly applies to business. Welcome to Winning Business Radio here at W4CY Radio. That's W4CY.com. And now, your host, Kevin Hallinan. Thanks for joining in today, everybody. I'm Kevin Hallinan. Thanks for being here. Welcome back to another episode of Winning Business TV and Winning Business Radio. We're live streaming, as you know. We're on W4CY.com and also Facebook at Winning Business Radio, as well as several other platforms. Coming soon, YouTube channel. So the mission of this show, as regular listeners know, is to avoid recreating and repeating the same mistakes as others. We're trying to offer insights and advice to help people avoid those mistakes, right? To learn best practices, the how-tos. Uh, learning the what to's and the what not to's to be challenged and I hope to be inspired by the successes of others. And so every successful person that I've ever had a chance to talk to, you know what, they've had some form of failure in their lives and careers. So listen, we all have to get our knees skinned once in a while. I always say I'm driven to help keep those scrapes from needing major surgery. Let's endeavor to learn from history so we don't repeat it. Today, my guest is John Corcoran. He's founder and president of RIN Advisors, a contingency-based cost-saving advisory for businesses. Here's John's bio. John Corcoran started RIN Advisors to help business owners and nonprofit organizations who are too busy to reduce costs. While businesses typically focus on sales and growth, cost reduction takes less effort and provides a faster impact to the bottom line. John's contingency-based model focuses on renegotiating expenses, such as insurance policies, WOTC, which I believe means work opportunity tax credits. I looked that one up, John. Payroll, copiers, cost segregation, energy, LED retrofits, and more. John grew up in Foxborough, Massachusetts, which is the home of Gillette Stadium and the New England Patriots. He graduated from Foxborough High School and then went on to earn his bachelor's in English from UMass Dartmouth. After college, John moved to Colorado for several years, as he says, to be a ski bum. I want to ask about that. While in Colorado, John got into the wine business and was a wine rep in Denver and Vail, then moved back, back to Boston in 01 and was a wine rep on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Later, John bought a franchise called Bevinco, where he increased profitability for bars and restaurants. Finally, he sold that company and founded Rin Advisors. John currently lives in Millis, Massachusetts, has a daughter, Zoe, who's 10, a son, Declan, who's 15. John, welcome to Winning Business Radio. Hey, thanks a lot. How are you, Kevin? I'm doing really well. I'm excited you're here. This is a cool Yeah, topic. great. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me on. Sure. I think people can learn a lot from you today. Um, I so I, I always like to start with kind of a background. And so first of all, tell us about your kids. Tell us about Zoe and Declan. Uh, yeah, my son, uh, Declan, is 15. Uh, he's a sophomore this year. He's uh, incredibly into skateboarding. He's way more coordinated than I ever was in my entire life. Um, so he's really, really good at it. It's kind of his passion. So him and I, uh, like, we did a road trip this summer out west and hit about 20 different skate parks, just nice. went around to four different states and uh, had a great time. Really good. And um, my daughter, Zoe's 10. She's in fifth grade. Uh, she's a super science nerd, which I love, absolutely love the fact that she's into like space and science and microscopes and all that engineering type stuff, which I was not very talented with, which is mm -hmm. why I got the, uh, the English degree. So, um, so yeah, they're great. They're, uh, they're the most fun part of my life. Certainly. That's awesome. Yeah. It's often, right. Well, I always say it's why we do what we do. Right. Um, right so I also like, as I said, the audience to have a bit of a backstory. So. You know, people know, I think, that Foxborough, you know, when they hear Foxborough, they think of the Patriots, even people that don't live in New England. But tell us about the town and what it was like to grow up there. Uh, it was good. It was, uh, you know, I graduated back in 91 and lived there my entire life up until I was 18. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a really small town and the population quadruples on Sundays, you know, yeah. so it's it's a little crazy and you kind of avoid the stadium. 
uh, on Sundays for the most part. But it was a lot of fun because, you know, it's a tiny town that ends up having a lot of really fun stuff going on. So so it was always good. And that was back before they built all the stores and all the yeah. other uh, plaza and stuff like that there at the uh, at the stadium. But um, but yeah, it was great. And I worked there for a few years, too. So it was always a good time, you know. So uh, but Foxborough did, was like it's really a small town that, that yeah. has this giant thing sitting in the middle of it, you know, which is, as you said, pretty quiet during the week. Completely. Yeah. 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 yeah it was very, very boring, <laughs> say the least. <laughs> so were you a long su- suffering Patriots fan before they started winning? Oh, yeah. Sullivan Stadium days and yeah. Uh, yeah. Schaefer Stadium days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. Actually, uh, Tony Eason, uh, the old quarterback, his house is right down the street from me and Millis here. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, those, every time I drive by it, I cringe a little bit just because of, uh, all those years of just losing and losing and losing, you know? Yeah. I remember this is unfair to him. I know, but, but <laughs> the, the quote was he heard footprints. Yeah. You yeah. Know, he would, he would, you know, he'd go down thinking he was going to get sacked on occasion when he wasn't going to get sacked. Yeah. So. yeah. Right. I'm sure <laughs> he did the best that he could. So what were your interests when you were a kid? Uh, I'm actually, uh, I'm an Eagle Scout, believe it or not. Most oh, people I like, tell that don't believe me. Um, but, uh, so I did that. Um, I think I got that when I was around 15 years old. And then during, um, uh, just during the year I would run cross country and track. I, I always, and I kind of feel this way too. It's, I guess, part of the entrepreneurial, uh, thing is, is, you know, I always did the running sports because the faster you ran and the better you were at it, the shorter the practices. <laughs> and I kind of view, you know, like, I don't, I don't want to work 60 hour a week. So the better I get at what I'm doing and the better I help people, the less I have to work because I'm more efficient and better. So, so that always kind of appealed to me. I wasn't a giant yeah. team sport guy, even though yeah. you're still on a team, but it's really individual efforts, you know, and that always appealed to me. So, so it was a little bit of sports, a little bit of camping, yeah. yep. stuff like that. Yeah, I was a I was a Boy Scout. I love my experience. I made it to first class. I was a an assistant senior patrol leader. That was kind of fun. But yeah, I never nice. made it. To Eagle. I wish I had, but I never made it to Eagle. Got involved. Yeah, I got to the point where uh, you know I started really getting into girls a little bit, and I knew that I was gonna not uh, want to do Boy Scouts much longer. So I really yeah. put my head down and and made sure that I finished. You know, so because I had done it so many years, I was like, all right, I gotta complete this. So, Very good. good. Very cool. Um, what did your parents do? Did they both work and did that shape your future at all? Uh, yeah, my mother's a teacher in Walpole. She was a middle school math teacher, which uh, is probably my worst nightmare because I failed math all through high school, um, which tortured my mother to death. God love her. But I mean, she's still around. Sorry, mom. She's still alive. But, but she just hated the fact that I couldn't do math whatsoever. And, um, but yeah, she uh, she retired from there. My dad worked for IBM, uh, so he was a project manager in the computer, uh, basically the training manuals, the mm-hmm. big thick books that are double the size of phone books. He was the one that managed the team to write all that for uh, for IBM. So, um, yeah, I through them I realized I definitely didn't want to be a math teacher, and I certainly didn't want to go into computers. So, uh, so I guess they helped me uh, pick yeah. what I didn't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I went to college. I didn't really know what I was going to do. And I just ended up with an English degree. And, you know, I kind of fumbled around in the beginning until I really kind of got my legs and figured out what I wanted to do when I grew up, which I guess I'm still waiting. Yeah, I'll I'll let you know when I'm there, too. Uh, How about siblings? Were you an only child? Did you have brothers, sisters? Yep. Yeah, I have an older sister, uh, which we fought like crazy until she went to college. And now we're really good friends. She lives uh, outside of Philly right now. And she's actually she's a ESL teacher. Um, out in Lancaster County, where all the uh, Amish people are at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so go back to English. Why did you decide? Was it an accidental major? Was it uh, intentional? And what did no, you- it was kind of mm-hmm. accidental. So I I got accepted into business because I've always been kind of the entrepreneurial type. Like I always won the Boy Scout fundraising, you know, efforts every year. And if there was a track fundraiser, I was always first. You know, I got super competitive on that stuff. So I really wanted to get into business, but freshman year, I didn't get into business one-on-one the first semester, and then I didn't get the second semester, and then my advisor forgot about me and didn't get me in sophomore year either. Oops. So here it is, beginning of junior year, and I hadn't taken any business classes, and my teacher's like, well, you're going to have to go for school for at least another year. I go, absolutely not. 
<laughs> I'm like, calculate the fastest way for me to get out of here in four years. And uh, so it was either English or psychology, and psychology would have been two more classes. So I picked English. There's that efficiency again. That's a theme. Well, I and I speak English too, which helped a lot. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, that's funny. I think. But yeah, I, uh, I intended to get a business degree, but I feel like I've kind of earned that over the last 25 years, anyway. Yeah. And UMass Dartmouth, I think, is like kind of a little hidden gem. Why'd you pick UMass Dartmouth? Uh, I kind of didn't know what I wanted to do, so I didn't want to spend money. Like I was looking at Penn State and some other places, and I was like, man, I don't want to spend a huge amount of money if I really don't know what I want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted someplace local, but far enough that my mom and dad couldn't just show up. Um, and it was kind of by the beach, yeah. too. So I was like, yeah. ah, what the heck, I'll just go here. And I thought about transferring, but I never ended up, uh, yeah, I never ended up doing it. But it was a good, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed it. It was good. And you're... Your, I guess it was LinkedIn said you were president of student activities. Talk about that. Yeah, that was fun. Um, so I basically was in the group that picked in um, and set up all the college performances. Like if we had, you know, national bands coming through, we had like yeah. Adam Sandler come through yeah. um, a lot of like little comedy nights and fundraising type stuff, you know, so it did a lot of, a lot of different things um, like that. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. I just, really enjoyed sort of the the setup and the contract i actually enjoyed figuring out the contracts too which is probably where i got what i'm doing now but but it was just fun and then you get to rub elbows with the famous people that come through and stuff like that it was just really kind of a good fun uh exercise you know were you responsible for the color of m&ms in the green room <laughs> no but i did run backstage at um at Great Woods or tweeter center or oh, xfinity okay. center or whatever they're calling it this month yeah. um so I actually did. I don't think I even told you this. So when I was in college and then a few years after college, I ran backstage and all the corporate boxes for uh, the performance center. So I would get the rider, which is like that. And I we did have one. It was Metallica wanted certain M&Ms. Uh, they asked for a whole bunch of inappropriate, illegal stuff, too, which I wasn't about to go get. Um, we had other bands that like uh, Pearl Jam wanted spring water just from Seattle, like one gallon jugs of spring water of a particular brand from Seattle. I'm like, I, I, that, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know, so I got a lot of really odd requests and it was kind of fun to go through and cross off the stuff um, uh, that they weren't going to get. But that stuff actually does go on. There's some really oddball things. That's funny. Yeah. I had this conversation with someone recently and they said their understanding was that it was just to be sure from the talent people that, the venue read the contract. It wasn't about yeah, I think M&Ms. It was about, did they read the contract? You know? Yep. Yeah. That was a lot of it um, because we'd go through and redline most of the, the BS that was in it. Yeah, yeah. But there was ones like the Allman brothers, the sound man had to have 10 tins of Copenhagen chew and they had to be date stamped less than um, a month. They had to be made a, a less than a month before. So it had to be, Fresh, like, all right, so great. Now I got to go find chewing tobacco, you know, like just really oddball stuff. But there were ones like that that were a deal breaker. Like, we will not start the show until these things are in place. You know, it was just very, uh, but it was kind of like a scavenger hunt. It was kind of fun yeah. at times. Yeah. Other times it was absolutely aggravating. Sound like, sounds like there's some lessons learned there, but let's pause. We're going to take our first break right here. John, we'll be back, everybody, with John Corcoran, founder and president of RIN Advisors. You're listening to Winning Business Radio with Kevin Hallinan on W4CY Radio. That's W4CY.com. Don't go away. More helpful information is coming right up, right here on Winning Business Radio. Hey everyone, I'm Jimmy Starr, the king of cool and your host of the Jimmy Starr Show, the entertainment radio show for all you cool and unique people looking to get a behind-the-scenes peek at what's going on in the entertainment industry. Listen in as me and my cool crowd of co-hosts bring you celebrity guests, new music, and the good times in fashion, entertainment, and pop culture. Right, everybody? Right! Tune in live Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern on W4CY.com. Hey, this is Kenny Wayne Shepherd, and you're listening to W4CY Radio. All 
This is Rebel Mother. Join me for In Your Face on W4CY.com, Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Bestian Wealth Management is a second-generation, family-owned financial planning and wealth advisory firm. In addition to coordinating complex business and personal planning needs, our firm takes a sincere interest in your well-being and personal values. Find us at bestgenwm.com. That's bestgenwm.com, where we consider all our clients an extension of our family. Advisory services offered through Commonwealth Financial Network, a registered investment advisor. And now back to Winning Business Radio with Kevin Hallinan, presenting exciting topics and expert guests with one goal in mind, to help you succeed in business. Here once again is Kevin Hallinan. Okay, a little quick change here. I just had, I was having technical problems before the show. I think my mic and headphones are back online. There we go. Perfect, perfect. So, John, I'm really curious about your your Colorado adventures. After college, uh, you said you bounced around a bit and you went to uh, what Vale and yeah, I was in Denver for a long time too. And yeah, so uh, so after I graduated uh, college, I got a job at Enterprise Rent a Car of all things, mm-hmm. and uh, basically I was cleaning out cars while wearing a suit, uh, and that lasted about three months, and I realized it just wasn't for me. Yeah. Uh, and some buddies from college got jobs out in Fort Collins, Colorado. So I ended up moving out there, um, had, I don't know, 500 bucks to my name, basically. It was just going to kind of wing it. So I got there and uh, I was just working in restaurants for a little bit for a couple of months. And then out of the blue, I got uh, this was back when answering machines existed. Uh, I got home from work at like one in the morning and there was a voicemail from one of the entertainers that I had booked at UMass Dartmouth who lived in Denver. and he said, I'm looking for a tour manager and a personal assistant. If you can start on Monday, um, you got the job. And of course I was, you know, cooking. So I'm like, I- I- I'm out, you know? So yeah. uh, two days later I moved to Denver and started traveling over 200 days out of the year um, as a-, a tour manager. So I did that for a couple of years. Um, but you know, being on the road that much is just absolutely exhausting. I mean, it was you must great, have learned was, a lot though. I mean, you learn about oh, logistics and making deals yeah. and getting stuff done. Oh, I had to do all the contracts, all the travel arrangements. I had to do all the stage setup, lights, sound, uh, payments. Uh, I had to sell stuff for him as well. And he was a very eclectic guy who had a lot of kind of personal issues that came out in his everyday life, I guess, is the nicest way I can put it. So after two years of it, I realized, you know, this isn't going to work permanently. But I learned more in that two years about how to deal with people. I mean, I was dealing with, like, we were on the Today Show, I was setting big stuff up with the PGA. I mean, just doing these giant things as a 22 year old, 23 year old. Um, So I learned a ton. Uh, And that was the biggest crash course. I think I learned more in those two years than I ever learned. Uh, before or since it was, it was an amazing time it was absolutely great i wouldn't trade it but i don't think i would do it again <laughs> you know? talk about the um, the first thing that comes to mind is confidence right talk about probably the confidence that you developed in ta- in dealing with a network or you know some of these otherwise big wigs right yeah um you know it was funny because it was before linkedin it was before the internet really i mean the internet was still dial up at that point yeah. so um, you know, I remember the PGA one, it was down in Florida, it was some big tournament. And, uh, my boss was performing for like the big gala or whatever. And I was getting in heated arguments at 22, 23 years old with the head of productions and events for the PGA. This woman, I don't know, she had to be 50, 55 at the time or whatever, clearly had been a professional forever. And I'm, you know, she's not going through everything that we need for the the show, for the performance. And so we're having heated arguments over the phone. And then when I finally showed up, I'm in like shorts and a t-shirt, flip flops. And when I showed up (laughs) to the stage to set everything up, she just rolled her eyes. She's like, are you serious? She's like, you're the one that I've been arguing over the phone. And I was just like, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) So now I don't know with LinkedIn and stuff like that. And it's, uh, it's, I guess it's a little bit different, but it was, it was pretty funny, but yeah, I had to learn early on that if you didn't talk a certain way or, 
or have the confidence, people would just steamroll right over you. And my mm. boss, I think early on, uh, I, not corrected me, but kind of showed me the right way to, and the wrong, definitely the wrong way uh, to do some of this stuff. So I kind of took some pieces of it and really learned the best way to get people to do what I need them to do, whether or not they want to do it or not. Right. right. And that, right. that's helped me a lot. Definitely. Um, how did you get into the wine business? Cause I think from there you went to, got into the wine business, correct? I did. Yeah. So yeah. I was living in Denver and uh, one day I was just sitting in my condo and I called my boss and I said, I, I can't work for you another day. Like if I, I'm just <laughs> done, I can't do it anymore. But the last show was in Maui. So yeah. I said, I'll give you a month's notice because we did 10 days in Maui. So I got to go on that trip. So, nice. um, but after that, I had no job lined up, no other skills and tour manager doesn't really translate to a lot of other things, but I had the, you know, the organizational experience and booking all the bands and stuff and that organization in college. Um, I just randomly fell into uh, a liquor job selling in downtown Denver and they gave me the worst dive bars you can possibly imagine. But lucky for them, back then, I really liked going to dive bars. So it was kind of fun. <laughs> it was all the music venues, like yeah, the gritty side yeah. of Denver. That was kind of the cool, fun, mm -hmm. young people, funky nightclub kind of thing. Um, and I did great with it. And about a year and a half later, the Vail territory opened up. And I wasn't married or anything. I had no real you know, ties to Denver. And mm -hmm. again, they just said, hey, if you can move up to Vail next week, you've got the job. And just like you know, when I first moved to Denver, three days later, I'm living up in the mountains. and selling wine so um which was great because i went from like the gutters of denver to the most expensive places in the entire state basically yeah. so i did that for about a year and a half and then didn't hurt that uh, you love to ski oh it was great yeah no i got a uh i had three restaurants that were on the mountain and i had the only way i could get to them was to put wine in my backpack hop on the lift and uh and go up and snowboard in between them uh, so I got a free ski pass for the year too, which was great, you Beautiful. know, all paid for. Oh, it was phenomenal. But, you know, I didn't have a car payment. I never went out. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't do anything. And I was still going in debt a thousand bucks a month because it was so expensive to live up there. Wow. Um, I just was like, all right, I'm either going to be, uh, you know, a bankrupt ski bum for the rest of my life or I have to kind of grow up and, you know, go back to the city and get a real job type thing. And, but I stayed in the wine business and just uh, moved to Boston. And then I ended up on Nantucket in the vineyard commuting, actually, uh, to sell wine down there. Commuting from where? I was living in Duxbury at the time. So, so it wasn't too bad. Wasn't too bad. Too bad. No, yeah. it was three days a week and I'd stay over one night, which is a mm -hmm. blast. And everything was all paid for. And yeah, you get to drive around Nantucket selling wine. I mean, how tough is that? And then really only selling wine for two, three days out of the week anyway for three or four months out of the year. It was pretty cush. It was good. These are restaurants, hotels, et cetera, bars. Yep. Yeah. All liquor stores, everything like that. Yeah. So it was everywhere on the Island. On both of them. What, uh, you, you can, or you don't have to, I'm not interested in the brand per se, but what kinds of wines? Uh, I mean, it was everything. There was, I think 22,000 SKUs. Oh, um, nice. so it was everything from just mm. rot gut box wine to, yeah. Yep. Um, you know, I had bottles that were $3,000 that I was selling down on Nantucket, you know? Um, I remember one night, uh, during wine festival, we, uh, went to the white elephant, got the private dining room and somebody that we knew worked there. And basically uh, we drank about $12,000 worth of wine and it just got comp to the place and everything. It was fantastic. Um, so, but that kind of led me into my next career. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I realized that I was basically drinking for free the whole time I lived in Colorado because I was a wine rep the whole time I was in Boston and the whole time I was on Nantucket, I might've, you know, maybe once a week I'd pay for a drink or once every other week, mm -hmm. but everybody was just giving everything away. And then, so when I decided I wanted to do something else, um, I found that franchise and it basically prevents people from getting free drinks. It's accountability, it's inventory staff management, loss well, control. There, there, let me interrupt. There's a difference there, yeah. right? If, if the distributor or the vineyard is providing, you know, free wine as a marketing tool, that's one thing, right? Oh yeah. But absolutely. if the, if the venue, if the hotel, the restaurant, the bar there, that's where, where it breaks down, where it's, it's really not free at that point. 
Yeah. And, you know, the best thing a restaurant or bar can do is buy their regular customers a a free drink because it's great advertising and there's, you know, you kind of get that goodwill. But Mm -hmm. if it's just being done so the bartender can get an extra tip at the end of the night and the restaurant doesn't get the goodwill from it, then that's stealing. So we had to differentiate that, train the staff on that and everything. So there's there's ways to do it the right way and there's the wrong way to do it, too. And everybody's doing it the wrong way. Because so I was like, you, you know, I drank for free for 10 years. And I'm like, <laughs> if I'm getting this, everybody yeah. is. So yeah. the franchise worked out great. I was hugely successful with that. How did you find that? It sounds like John Tapper almost, but probably nicer. I, it, it's pretty much that without all the screaming and yelling. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't theater. remodel anything, but yeah. it was really going in. And, you know, I, I have one nightclub that was losing $14,000 a week, you know, at, from theft. You know, and when you go in and I, I think I was charging them like 400 bucks a week to go in and figure all this stuff out. So for them, it was a, a bargain. You know? So but what kind of theft was it? Was it over pouring? Was it bottles? Was it just in most of it's usually over pouring? It's yeah. people not bringing drinks in. Uh, you know, you sit down and you, you throw the bartender at 20 when you order your first drink and tip them. Then you're probably going to get a few more free drinks, you know. Uh, so little tricks like that. I had one place that the owner was just an awful person and the whole staff was stealing everything. So they would steal, you know, 30 to 50 bottles uh, of liquor a week. Wow. And this guy wouldn't even notice that they were just taking cases out. But the owner wasn't sober enough to see what the heck was going on most of the time. And uh, so that wasn't that was just kind of theft at cost. But theft of retail is mm-hmm. giving away the free drinks. Mm-hmm. And that's really where you end up losing That's when you end up losing your business. So how do you prevent that? What do you do? Um, It's a series of checks and balances. We do weekly inventory and we could weigh the liquor bottles. So you could tell the millionth of an ounce exactly what was used Hmm. versus what was rung into the register. So it was basically liquor auditing on a weekly basis. And you could tell right to the the drop exactly what was missing. And then it's just holding the, the employees accountable. And usually it tightens up within two weeks and, if it doesn't, they then they realize it's being looked at, right? Yeah, that's just it. Most of the time, it's just not mm. being looked at. And then once it happens, they're they're tightened up. I had one uh, I had one bartender get up and walk out uh, in my intro meeting because he knew about my company, and he said, "No, I'm done." And he got up and walked out and quit right at the spot. So. You ever see anybody prosecuted? Never got that. No, nah, no, but I I've caught some crimes. Uh, you know, there was people that were stealing cash and stuff like that. Oh, wow. um, yeah, there's there's lots of really bad stuff that goes on. But no, most of the time they don't prosecute because they don't want the police and yeah. Yeah. things like that poking around in their business. Because a lot of restaurants have two sets of books. Not all of them. I but don't know what you're talking do. about. La, 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't want the IRS coming yeah. in and uh, asking Yikes. questions. Or, Yikes. Yeah. We'll edit that part. No, this is live. We don't edit anything. <laughs> All right. We're going to take our second break. But my my suspicion is that's when you figured out that you could help people save a lot of money, right? Yeah. And I really liked it. Uh, like, I, I, I'm fascinated with everybody else's mm. businesses. I just mm-hmm. don't want to run their businesses. So that's that experience led me to kind of what I'm doing now as well. All right. We'll come back and introduce that more than we did in the in the bio. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes with John Corcoran of Rin Advisors. You're listening to Winning Business Radio with Kevin Hallinan on W4CY Radio. That's W4CY.com. Don't go away. More helpful information is coming right up, right here on Winning Business Radio. Have you ever dreamed of having your own radio show? Well, W4CY Radio makes dreams come true. You can be a radio personality on the number one ranked internet radio station in West Palm Beach, Florida. We can be heard in 105 countries and all U.S. states. Promote your business. Earn up to $10,000 per month and more. It's all up to you. Have fun and be heard. Call 561-506-4031. That's 561-506-4031. Start your radio show now. This is Rebel Mether. Join me for In Your Face on W4CY.com, Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Bestian Wealth Management is a second-generation, family-owned financial planning and wealth advisory firm. In addition to coordinating complex business and personal planning needs, 
our firm takes a sincere interest in your well-being and personal values. Find us at bestgenwm.com. That's bestgenwm.com, where we consider all our clients an extension of our family. Advisory services offered through Commonwealth Financial Network, a registered investment advisor. Hey, this is Johnny Three Tears from Hollywood Undead, and you're listening to W4CY Radio. I do whatever it takes to make it right through. Anything I face to face with it true. And now back to Winning Business Radio with Kevin Hallinan, presenting exciting topics and expert guests with one goal in mind, to help you succeed in business. Here once again is Kevin Hallinan. Welcome back, everybody. I finally get rid of that little nonsense, the digital nonsense in my lower right there. Uh, that was bothering me. Um, so we're back, of course, with John Corcoran of Root Advisors. John, I was really intrigued that you figured out how you can help companies save money. Describe Rin Advisors, and then we'll talk about sort of the formation, where this idea came from, uh, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, Rin Advisors. Uh, so it's a contingency-based cost reduction mm-hmm. model. Um, so no money up front. I just go in and I'm really just kind of gambling my time that clients are losing money. And I mean, realistically, everybody's losing money to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I do is I go in and I go through all their vendor files um, and benchmark everything, see where there might be some opportunities to reduce the costs um, or take advantage of other things that the client might not know about. Um, and I also implement everything as well, because what I've found that people have almost no time to do mm-hmm. any of this stuff, which is why I exist. Um, and so, uh, there's really all, all my clients really do is make yes, no decisions on whether or not they want to move ahead with the different items that I find. And they're not obligated to implement anything, but obviously they'd be crazy not to, if I'm going to save them some cash. You know? And just to be clear, uh, you say contingency based Describe that so the, the yeah. uh, viewers are clear on that, what that means. Yep. So I simply uh, share the savings. Um, so it's I just take a percentage. It depends on what um, uh, what topic we're working on. Mm-hmm. Some of the stuff is 50% for a year. Some of it's 20. Some of it's 5%. Some of the stuff I get paid by the vendors. Uh, so it really depends. I have it all delineated. But um, I don't bill any of my clients until they actually start saving hard dollars into their savings account or bank account. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I'll start billing after that. So, and then it's only for 12 months. There are some other people out there that do two years, three years, but you know, I'm a small shop. So one year I think is pretty fair and uh, and it seems to be working with everybody. So let's talk about some areas where people are spending more than they ought to, or don't know they're spending more than they ought to. Um, You know, the, it really depends on the business, but one of the biggest things is one, everybody's too busy. And then two, yeah. people have this implicit trust with, um, with their vendors. You know, if they've had them, we've had them for 10 years, 15 years, it's my cousin, it's, you know, my buddy from college works there, whatever. So I've heard it all, you know, and it's really going in and figuring out who, you know, which numbers have crept up, um, you know, on, on different vendors and different bills and things like that. Uh, copier leases are always huge. Those are usually double what they should be. Um, they're the most confusing, convoluted contracts you'll ever see. And people spend absolute fortunes on them and they should be spending. Us- I usually see at least, at least 50% reduction in that. Can uh, the biggest that thing- for a second? Can I pause on that? Yeah. How do you get the copier company uh, to renegotiate a contract if they've got a three-year deal or two-year deal or something? Yeah. Copier ones are a little stickier because they're usually financed through a third party uh, oh, financing okay. source like Capital One. So mm-hmm. some of those you can't break, but you just kind of look at it and say, all right, well, you're already on your first auto renew. Or if you're on your second auto renew, you can break it. Um, so it's just looking into things like that, seeing if there's ways to even rewrite the contract and say, hey, this is too high. It's going to run out in a year. But if we can rewrite it now at a normal oh, amount, then we'll extend sense. it and sign another five year deal. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's it's trying to make it work for everybody. And my goal overall for everything is to keep the current vendors in place. Because if you just go in and rip everything out and change vendors and kill relationships, it it creates mayhem and, and stress that nobody needs. And I end up making the exact same amount of money in the end anyway. So mm. it's just simpler to, to stick with what I got. Uh, but one of the bigger ones, actually the biggest thing that I find is insurance policies. 
Um, you know, all with forms. insurance agents. Sorry. All forms. Yep. Yeah. Health, PNC, um, mm -hmm. everything, cyber, you name it. Um, so those are one of those trusted advisor things, but the, the insurance agents sort of blur that line a little bit because they're really commissioned sales reps for large insurance carriers. Mm -hmm. And then the insurance carriers give these side kickbacks to the agency if they hit certain revenue levels mm -hmm. each year. So if you're with one agency, they might only really push two carriers because they're trying to hit financial goals. So at the end of the year, the principals can get a big check back on it. So a lot of times I find that the agents are putting it out to you know various different uh, carriers beyond those two, but you can make anything look good and make anything look bad. So um, there's usually some big opportunities and, and that level of trust, when you're a commissioned sales rep, it's very convoluted and you don't know really where the line is. There's tons of great insurance agents, but that's by far the biggest opportunity, usually multiple six figures in savings on those. Wow. Yeah, um, it's a drastic amount. Workers uh, comp too is a universal. Uh, oh, that's everybody right. hates workers comp, but there's always expensive. giant money buried in those. Yeah. It's one yeah. thing I remember about workers comp, always expensive, never cheap. And sometimes yes. hard to get, right? And it's universally hated. Yeah. So WOTC, was I right? It's work opportunity tax credits and IRS. Yeah, uh, that's savings. that's a great one. Yep. There's uh, so that's a federal program that started up right after World War II. Uh, so all the GIs were coming back from the war and it was an incentive to get companies to hire these guys and, you know, mm -hmm. get them back into civilian life. So it extended through that into the 70s. They added uh, like felons, people getting out of jail so they wouldn't mm -hmm. reoffend. They'd have a job. Um, and then in the 2000s, loads of little micro groups uh, got in. So, you know, opportunity zone type places, uh, veterans have always been part of it. Uh, anybody mm -hmm. who's on SNAP or, or any form of state assistance, um, you get an average of $2,400 for hiring anybody that qualifies for those. And, and with the pandemic that just went by, the vast majority of people these days are qualifying for. It. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a great one. I had one client got $9,600 for hiring an engineer and the guy was making 200000 a year, but he was a veteran that got injured on duty and uh, wow. and they were going to hire him anyway, but they got 9600 bucks because well, he did the forms. And Yeah, they probably didn't it. know either, as you said, they don't have time or in that case, did they not even know the program existed? Well, it's it's something that the like the Fortune 1000, all those companies yeah. do it automatically. They're all doing it, but none of the mom and pops that I run hmm. into uh, have really heard about it. I've had maybe three clients in six years know even what it was or had heard of it. Before. So I was going to ask this a bit later, but um, you can work anywhere, right? Not state specific. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, no, I've, uh, I, I'd say 90% of my business is New England, but I have clients mm -hmm. in California, Florida, Chicago, New York, pretty much everywhere. So I was going to do this later, but I'll do it now. You see the crawl, everybody, RIN Advisors, R-I-N-N, advisors.com. You may want to reach out to John. Thanks, Roxy, for putting that up there. Um, payroll copiers. Uh, oh, payroll. Oh, just payrolls. Processing fees. Go ahead. Payroll is a great one. Yeah. So yeah. my first question, so I have a questionnaire that I go through with all my clients. And the very first question I have is, what's your payroll company? And if it's ADP or paychecks, um, it opens up all these other cans of worms. Mm. Uh, which hopefully nobody from ADP or paychecks is watching this, but uh <laughs> But, you know, when they they're good at sending out paychecks, they're expensive to do it, but that's really what they're good at. But when right. you start adding in your workers comp to it as, with their pay as you go program mm -hmm. or if they're managing your 401k for you or they're doing tax filings and things like that, they are uh, in my experience with my clients, they tend to flub more than they help. Mm. Um, and it's incredibly expensive. I had one client who was a lumberyard client and. They were paying, uh, I think, eighty thousand dollars a year. No, it was one hundred and eighteen thousand a year for payroll, and I got it down to like sixty, uh, wow. just because they had just crept it up year after year and kept adding on and and selling them things that they didn't need that they didn't even know they bought, you know. So when you start to unwind all that stuff and unbundle it, there's tons and tons of savings in there. Wow. Yeah. Um, I want to get back to cost segregation, but energy and and lighting. Yeah, there's always, uh, well, in Massachusetts, it's deregulated, so you can pick a supplier. And usually mm -hmm. there's a tiny bit of savings. It's not usually a massive amount unless you haven't looked at your bill in a long, long time. 
Right. Uh, but those are pretty straightforward. I usually just kind of do a checkup on those to make sure that, you know, their contract didn't run out and the supplier didn't just jack the rate up and they didn't notice. Uh, but like in Massachusetts, they do a ton of uh, LED retrofits in commercial mm. buildings. So mm -hmm. whenever I walk in, I automatically look at the ceiling and see what kind of lights they have. And if they have the old fluorescent tubes, there's tons and tons of uh, programs and money out there. And, you know, they're talking about the new infrastructure bill is going to help that even more. But like I have a client where I got them $157,000 worth of free lights from uh, Eversource. They wow. signed a piece of paper and four months later, the stuff got installed and they were good to go. So. There's all sorts of little like programs and secret handshakes you can do to get into these things. And really, uh, you know, you save your com uh, clients a ton of money every month, too, because their electric bill usually goes down yeah, 20 to 30 yeah. percent as well. All right. Cost segregation. This is an area that uh, I don't think most people have even heard of, let alone understand. Yeah, no, that's a great one, too. Um, and yeah, I have I have uh, clients that own massive buildings that hadn't taken advantage of it. And a lot of CPAs will talk about it, but CPAs don't do it because uh, you need a, an engineering study to go with it. So what that is, is an accelerated depreciation of an asset. So if you buy uh, you know, a building, commercial building, instead of breaking it up over 37 years uh, evenly, you know, you'll take the total purchase price, subtract out the land, and your CPA will divide it by 37 and have 37 even buckets mm -hmm. of uh, money to depreciate. Well, your carpet, your doorknobs, your water heaters, all that stuff isn't going to last 30 years. So it allows you to accelerate the depreciation. You need to take a much bigger chunk within the first year. Uh, and actually the first three years, um, you can really, really have a big impact on that. I just had a client uh, bought and remodeled a medical building and they're getting, uh, I think it was 450000 in accelerated depreciation this year. Wow. Uh, which is going to be huge for them. And that's real money because it's it's depreciation. It's it's a deduction which saves them tax dollars. Correct? Absolutely. Yeah. So if you're gonna hang on to a building for more than five years, it's worth doing. If you're just gonna flip it in a year or two, it's not really worth it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're gonna hold on to it for five, seven, ten years, then um, it's a really, really great strategy. Wow. Can yeah. you give some? Uh, I, I love the examples. Can you give a couple more examples of maybe? You don't have to mention names, of course, but maybe some situations, the more dramatic type savings. Yeah, I had a, oh, this was a good one. So I have a, for the insurance one, I had a distributor. It's a, well, if I say kind of what it is, you'll figure it out. But they have uh, 800 employees. Um, they do a lot of retail stores and uh, prepare fresh food and stuff like that. And uh, mm -hmm. anyways, they had the same insurance agent, health agent for eight years. And she was on their bowling team. She baked them fresh cookies every month. She had a barbecue in the parking lot every summer. She's the greatest. Everyone loves her. And I'm like, well, that's fine. I'm not here to replace your agent. I'm just here to make sure that you're spending what you should. So they were a self-insured company. We went through everything and realized that with the pharmacy piece of it, um, the agency was keeping 80% of the rebates and only passing 20% of the money through. To the client when realistically the client should have got like 90 percent of it so that was 200 i think that was 230,000 a year wow that they had lost simply because the agent didn't you know she put in the percentages that she wanted not the uh, percentages that they should have had and they fired her right on the spot which is never my intention i'm not there to get sure. fired i'm just there sure. to reduce bills and not create mayhem but they lost well over two million bucks uh since they signed up with her you know, and, you know, we ended up, we had a great agent that we could plug in there for a year until they could find somebody else and it worked out really well, but that was pretty big. And then another one, um, I have, uh, there's another program called workforce training grants. Oh, yes. um, and any, yeah, any EIN, uh, in Massachusetts can get $250,000, uh, in free training grant money and you have two years to do it. Well, I have a car dealership group that has eight locations, so they have actually 10 EIN numbers because of the parent company and some other ones. So they were eligible for basically $2 million worth of training, which you can never use that much, you know. Uh, but we ended up getting them about $400,000 in training. We're having uh, professional service writer trainers, sales trainers. Uh, you know, we're having business coaches come in. We're having the accounting department is going to go through training to relearn the systems and the platforms and the accounting software. And they're all excited because they're going to make more money and they don't really have to pay for it. It comes out of the, uh, the payroll taxes that you're already paying. 
Like there's a gigantic slush fund at the state house. Uh, yeah, no, it's, millions, it's there. Yeah, it's there for it's gigantic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's huge, and no one. It's just like the worker tax credit. Nobody takes them. No one talks about them. But it's just sitting there, and it's yours. You know, I'm eligible for two hundred fifty thousand if I wanted it. I, know I could never get through it. But right. That's right. that's another great one. Yeah. So it's it's kind of two perspectives. If you're not going to, if you hadn't really thought about training people, you can at the Commonwealth's dime and actually it's employers dimes every time, you know, a dollar of, of what unemployment, the, the employer portion of the unemployment, uh, panel, uh, fee goes into the fund, right? So much percentage. Yeah, exactly. Fund. Yeah. It's sitting yeah. I there. think it's uh, I think it's a half a percent or it's okay. like a nickel for every dollar or something like that. So if you weren't going to train your people, you can without those dollars. If you were going to train your people anyway, you can do it without cost. Yeah, like I have a I have a car dealership down in Plymouth, and uh, we're doing the same thing. We're gonna get uh, they're getting eighty thousand dollars, but wow. uh, yeah, we set up the trainers, we set up the program, we're gonna curate the curriculum to to match exactly what they need, um, and we're doing sales and service. And the GM is excited because he is gonna have professional training that he couldn't afford. They didn't have it in the budget, and now they do. So it's it's a win for everybody. And obviously there are people from multiple states, many states listening or in watching today. So, right. you know, other states, uh, I'm sure have this. How would they find that out? What What's your best advice if somebody's uh, making contact me? I have I have uh, people that have companies that can set this stuff up in all different states. Mm -hmm. Like I know New York, I think they reimburse 50 percent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's not, you know, free there. But there's a lot of uh, programs out there that are just untapped in all different states. Um, so if you just reach out to me, I can connect them with somebody um, that can help them out locally and make sure Great. they can get what they can. Great. Uh, so you said geography doesn't matter. Who's an ideal client for you? Um, I, well, I do about a third of nonprofits, which is fun. Mm. Uh, I really love doing nonprofits just because they're so thankful for every single penny you yeah. find them. And, yeah. you know, and I don't know, I'm not super old. I'm 47. But, you know, you get to the age where the appreciation kind of matches the income. Uh, so that's kind of the feel good end of it. Um, but, you know, anybody that's probably got, say, more than 50 employees, um, mostly my stuff's between uh, 20 and 200 million uh, in income a year. Um, but realistically, anyone with 50 employees are up uh, is fine. But honestly, I never say no to anybody. Like I just picked up a woodworking shop that does 2 million a year and they have three employees. But the guy's way too busy and, yeah. and just doesn't have the time. And it's going to take me maybe four hours to go through his entire stuff, the whole project. Excellent. So for me, the guy really needs it. And I just, I'm not the kind of, I, I go back to my Eagle Scout, Boy Scout stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I got to be helpful and I can't say no, but you know, like that giant car dealership, I've been working them for two and a half years now and the wood shop, I'll probably work with them for six hours. You know? So it's just one of those things that I'll take anybody, but you know, it's just as much work to do one of the big companies as it is right. the little ones too. So I'll, I'll take the big ones all day, but I love helping people. Well, surprisingly, we're out of time. I was into this conversation. It's Rin Advisors, R-I-N-N -N, advisors.com. His name's John Corcoran. Reach out if you have any questions. John, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. No, this is great. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you got it. And everybody else, thanks for being here. Thanks for watching or listening. This is a show about business and business challenges. If you've got concerns about the growth of your company, feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on Facebook or LinkedIn at Winning Business Radio. You can send me an email if you want. Kevin at winningbusinessradio.com. One of the many email addresses, right, John? Uh, our company is Winning Incorporated. We're part of Sandler Training. We develop sales teams into high achievers and sales leaders into true coaches and mentors. We're not right for everybody, but listen, maybe we should have a conversation. Thank you, as always, to uh, expert engineer Roxy. She does a great job. Tune in again next Monday, September 27th, 4 p.m. Eastern. My guest will be Danny Schumann, brand storyteller and executive coach, coach of his company called Twist Your Thinking. You'll enjoy that one. Until then, this is Kevin Hallinan. Thanks for being here, everybody. You've been listening to Winning Business Radio with your host, Kevin Hallinan. If you missed any part of this episode, the podcast is available on Talk 4 Podcasting and iHeartRadio. For more information and questions, go to winningbusinessradio.com or check us out on social media. 
Tune in again next week and every Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time to listen live to Winning Business Radio on W4CY Radio, W4CY.com. Until then, let's see where others have failed and win in business with Kevin Hallinan and Winning Business Radio. 